Good morning, everyone. Hope you all um, are well. I've had a good weekend, get some good rest. Uh, before we begin, if someone would be willing to open us in prayer. We ask for your presence to fill us, your knowledge to guide us. We give us with our mom and hands. We bless her in the name of Jesus. I thank you for all my classmates over here, Lord. Bless them all in the name of Jesus. Help us to open our spiritual minds and the heart and ears and the eyes uh, to open them all and to listen to your word uh, with a deep understanding. Jesus, help us to understand. Holy Spirit, you guide us. Holy Spirit, you teach us. And whatever we learn today, God, help us the light in our lives so that we can live powerfully for your kingdom so that we can live in boldness uh, to preach the gospel jesus let every word be uh, a seed that is being planted in our heart which will bear a fruit in our life for sure we give you all the glory and honor in jesus name i pray amen good morning everyone okay so um yeah, last week I had to cancel class uh, and I said I would post the video uh, for last week, but I was able to do it. Um, I'll try and get that done this week and post it and I'll also post, uh, I think we had three assignments left, I'll at least post the two and then um, I'll move the quiz to the end of the semester. So uh, I'll post the quiz maybe the last week of the semester. But uh, yeah, the last two assignments as well, I'll try and post this week. So already we just get a problem on Google Classroom and on the e learning platform. Uh, so last week, um, yeah, we missed last week, but before that, we had looked at First Corinthians 11 and uh, then the beginning of First Corinthians 12. Uh, so in First Corinthians 11, we looked um, a little bit at this whole thing of women covering their head uh, in worship. What does that mean? Uh, and understanding uh, spiritual headship. So uh, how is the man uh, head over a woman, so it prepared that in the context of marriage, and um, and why uh, women were asked to cover their heads in that cultural context. Uh, after that, we looked at the Lord's Supper and some practices that uh, Paul talked about, uh, specifically things that were happening in the Corinthian church, uh, where there was that continued division between rich and poor, where uh, there wasn't unity in the church. So when they were coming together and celebrating the Lord's Supper, they were not uh, remembering what Christ had done for them, and they were not coming together in a way that was glorifying to Christ. And so uh, Paul's correction of the church in the Lord's Supper uh, was another thing we looked at. And then we started with chapter 12, uh, where we started to look at uh, Paul's teaching on the spiritual gifts. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll just go back to the beginning of chapter 12. Uh, and if someone could read uh, that whole chapter for us, and then we will go through the, our discussion on it. One 
First Corinthians chapter 12, uh, verses 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus a curse, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. These, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Shall I continue? So uh, that first section, the first 11 verses, uh, Paul uh, starts to teach about the spiritual gifts. Now we know, as we read uh, earlier in in the same letter, uh, that the gifts were already being exercised within the church. And in fact, uh, they were seeing a lot of uh, the spiritual gifts being uh, given to members of the church and being used within the church. Uh, so there was no lack in terms of um, having the gifts present in the church. Uh, but what they lacked was the understanding of uh, what the purpose was of the gift and how they would utilize it uh, in a way that would benefit one another when they gathered as a church. Um, so we talked about... Uh, some of this already last uh, the last time we met. Uh, so the spiritual gifts refers to something that is supernatural, also not things that we have acquired by our own learning or our own not skills that we naturally have, uh, but something that is given to us that is given to us uh, from God. Uh, and in verse two, uh, it talks about. Uh, how they were worshipping idols that couldn't speak, uh, but now to recognize that by the Spirit of God, the things that come out of their mouth uh, are given by the Holy Spirit. So uh, unlike the idols they worshipped who themselves couldn't speak, the Holy Spirit is alive and, uh, and through us, uh, speaks through us. So through our lips, uh, Jesus is glorified. And so if we uh, recognize Jesus as Lord uh, by our words, then that has to be the work of the Holy Spirit. On the other hand, if we are saying things against Jesus, uh, then that cannot be by the Holy Spirit. So to recognize that what comes out of our lips uh, will uh, reflect whether the Holy Spirit is at work in us uh, and whether we are being led by the Holy Spirit in what we say. Um, verse 4, uh, so then he goes on to talk about these different spiritual gifts. So he says, uh, there is a diversity of gifts. So although there are many gifts that come from the Holy Spirit, uh, they are a variety of gifts, but yet it's the one Spirit who gives those gifts. Uh, verse 5, I'm just going quickly through this because we already covered this uh, last time. Um, there are a difference of ministries, but the same Lord. So here, uh, talking about uh, the office or the function of uh, a person within the church. So previously, he's talking about the spiritual gifts in the previous verse, verse 4. In verse 5, he's talking about your function within the church. So you might be a pastor, you might be a teacher, you might be an intercessor, you might be a prophet. So different uh, roles that you may have within the church. Uh, that also comes 
from the same Lord. So from Jesus, Jesus gives us uh, each, uh, gives different people different functions. Not everyone may have a role or a function to play in the church, but everyone has a, a spiritual gift. So we'll, kind of, we'll talk a little more about that. Uh, verse six, there are diversity of activities. So, uh, but it's the same God who works all in all. So depending on your role or your function within the church, how your gift comes out uh, will look different. Uh, so you might have the gift of prophecy um, as someone who is an intercessor. So while praying for people, uh, God gives you a word of knowledge or uh, gives you something to pray over a person and you're able to pray that. Um, Whereas someone might have the function of a prophet itself. And so when they uh, are exercising the gift of uh, prophecy, when they have a word of knowledge, uh, they may declare it to the church or they may declare it to a group of people. So how that same gift is used depends on the function that you play or the uh, role that you have within the church. Uh, so that is what we mean by diversity of activities. So how the gift is manifested in your specific function uh, may look different, but it's the same God who works all in all. So uh, in all of these things, we have one Holy Spirit, one Father, uh, one Lord Jesus, who is uh, giving us these gifts, who is uh, giving us roles within the church, and then is enabling us to use these gifts in the roles that we play in the church. Uh, so we looked at this example of uh, different kinds of uh, workmen, right? So elect an electrician, a plumber, a carpenter, an auto mechanic. So all of them have different roles, but all of them work with tools. Uh, so they may use a hammer or a screwdriver, uh, different things that they use to do their work. In the same way, uh, as believers, we have the toolbox of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and depending on the role that we are playing, how we use those tools uh, will look different and how it is expressed and how it impacts other people will look different uh, because of the role we play. So verse seven, the manifestations of the spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Uh, so this is the kind of uh, like a, a summary statement of why do we have uh, the gifts of the spirit. So although there are many gifts that come in many forms uh, that come from the Holy Spirit to every believer, uh, the purpose of that gift is to benefit the rest of the body. Uh, it is not for our own glory. Uh, it's not to uh, project how holy we are or how spiritual we are or how mature we are. Uh, rather, it is to bless the other believers. And so how we use those gifts in these gatherings, or what Paul will talk about as we gather as a church, uh, must be in a way that will benefit one another, because that's the purpose of the gifts. Uh, so I think we went up to verse 7 last time. So from verse 8 to 8 onwards is where we hadn't covered. Uh, so verse 8, but to one is given the word of wisdom through the spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same spirit, to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, uh, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. Um, and so we see here uh, those three sets of gifts, uh, the uh, vocal gifts, that is uh, the gift of tongues, uh, the gift of prophecy, the gift of interpretation of tongues, uh, then the revelatory gifts, so gifts that enable us to reveal something to people, so a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge, a discerning of spirits, uh, and then the power gifts, which are the gifts of healing, working of miracles, and faith. Uh, so we see here that Paul is 
listing those spiritual gifts here, the nine gifts of the spirit. Um, so you, you've you already covered the gifts of the spirit uh, before, right? Uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit in your classes. Uh, so you're already familiar with this, but we'll just uh, look at it a little quickly. The difference between the gifts of the spirit versus the membership gifts versus the ministry gifts, because Paul will talk a little bit about all of them uh, in this in this chapter. So the gifts of the spirit is what he's listed here. These nine gifts that are available to all believers, uh, and uh, we can desire to have these gifts and. It's from having that desire that God gives us the gifts and we're able to manifest it and bless the church. Um, on the other hand, there are membership gifts. So Romans 12, 6 to 8 uh, covers this, uh, the membership gifts specifically. There are other passages in the New Testament as well. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12 uh, also will talk about it in verses 12 to 27. Uh, there's Ephesians 4, 7. 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11. Uh, so all of these talk about the membership gifts. Uh, now, these gifts are given uh, to believers based on their role or their function. So uh, whatever is their role in the church that God wants them to play within uh, the church, uh, they have a membership gift to uh, to carry out that role to carry out that function so every believer uh, may have one or more of these membership gifts uh, so suppose they are a teacher or a leader they may be both a teacher and a leader uh, they may be gifted in giving uh, they may be gifted in mercy uh, they may have the gift of administration of helps uh, so, depending on what their role is within the church, uh, the gift for carrying out that role is called a membership gift. Uh, and then the third kind of gift is the uh, ministry gift, and this is given only to specific individuals. We see that in Ephesians 4.11, and uh, Paul references it a little bit here in 1 Corinthians 12 as well. Uh, so the five ministry gifts are the apostle, the prophet, the pastor, the teacher, and the evangelist. Um, and these gifts are given specifically to equip believers uh, to do ministry. Uh, so these leaders, the apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist, uh, are placed as leaders over the church, uh, as people to, uh, to equip uh, believers so that they can fulfill uh, their roles in ministry. Uh, so whether it is within the church or outside the church. So these are the three different kinds of gifts. And so in verse 8 to 10, Paul is specifically talking about the gifts, uh, just uh, the gifts of the spirit, uh, which are available to all believers. Verse 11. But one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Uh, so again, here Paul repeats that that all these gifts uh, come from the one spirit. Uh, so although there are these nine different gifts that are being exercised in our gatherings as a church, uh, everything's coming from the same Holy Spirit, and it's the Holy Spirit who wills that giving. So uh, it's not uh, something uh, that we have to beg for or plead for. The Holy Spirit desires to give us that gift. And as we desire, like as we also have the desire to receive and uh, are willing to cooperate with how the Holy Spirit wants to move through us, uh, then the gifts will be manifested in us. So uh, we can move on from there. Any questions? What we've covered so far? Okay, we'll uh, continue. Continue into verse 12 uh, onwards. If someone can read verses 12 to 27, please.
Thanks for the chapter 12, verse 12 to 27. For as the body is one and has many members, but all members of that one body being many or one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member but many. If the food should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the earth should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If, if the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole body were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them in the body, just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable on those we best of great honor and our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body having given greater honor to that part which lacks it that there should be no schism in the body but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. Um, so here we go into uh, the section where uh, Paul is talking uh, from the perspective of each one of us has a function to play. Each one of us has a role to play uh, because uh, as, um, as the body of Christ, we are a physical representation of Christ on the earth. And so just like we have a physical body, with different parts, the body of Christ is that physical uh, reflection of who Christ is, and each of us uh, acts like a part of that body. So each of us has a function according to the part we have to play. Um, so we look through these verses and also do a quick summary uh, that is uh, there in your notes. Um, so verse. Well, yeah, just as a body has many parts, uh, all its, uh, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. So just a reminder that uh, although we are all different uh, and each of us uh, comes from a different place, each of us has a different background, each of us has a different uh, role in society, in the society around us, uh, each of us has a different spiritual background, all of these things, cultural background, uh, we all come with all of these differences, uh, but when we are in Christ, we are one. Uh, we become one in Christ. Um, and so he specifically says, uh, verse 13, Jews, Gentiles, slave, or free. It doesn't matter uh, what your background was, the Jews or Gentiles, what your spiritual background, what your cultural background is, uh, slave or free, what your uh, social status is, what your financial, economic statuses, um, all of those things don't matter. But when you come together, uh, you recognize that we are all together functioning um, under the headship of Christ, and we all work together for the purposes of Christ, for the mission of Christ. Um, and so just as the Holy Spirit was given to every one of us, uh, irrespective of the background uh, we are from, so we must recognize that all of us are equal. There is no difference uh, between us based on what we were before we came to the body of Christ or what we are outside in the world, where the world looks at us, what they see about us, uh, doesn't matter. When we come into the body of Christ, 
uh, our identity changes because we all have this one spirit and it is this one spirit that unites us. Um, verse 14, even though the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Uh, now, verses 15 uh, to 20, uh, he's talking from the perspective of somebody who feels unimportant in the body of Christ. Uh, so they where they look at somebody else and they say, because I'm not like that, uh, I, I'm not a part of the body. So the foot says, because I'm not a hand, I'm not a part of the body. Uh, if the ear says, because I'm not an eye. So that is so common within the church, right? We look at uh, somebody who seems seemingly has a very important role in the church. And we think because I'm not in that role or in that function, uh, I don't have to do anything with it. I just like sit back. I'm not gifted in music, uh, so um, so I can't serve in the church. I'm just going to come here and attend the services. But uh, that is not the case, right? So each of us has a role, uh, and all of our roles are important because if we don't function, if we don't do our roles, then we're losing out on one function of the body. Uh, so he says, just because you think that way, just because you think because I'm not an I, I don't belong to the body, uh, that doesn't mean that you are no longer a part of body. Whether you recognize it or not, you are a part of the body and you have a role to play. Uh, and if you don't play that role, then your function is not happening within the body. So he says, uh, if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? So that function of hearing would be lost. Or uh, if the whole body were a ear, where would the sense of smell be? That ability of the body to smell, to hear, uh, all those things would be lost if we didn't have those very essential parts. Um, but in fact, God has placed the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? Um, so it is the very fact that we have these differences, these uh, different gifts, these different roles, these different functions, uh, that makes us a body, right? If we didn't have different roles and functions, then we couldn't be called a body and we'd just be called an eye or we'd just be called a ear. Uh, but to be called a body which has different parts and different uh, functions for each part, there has to be diversity. There has to be a difference in the kinds of things we are doing in the um, in what is accomplished through each role uh, in the work that is being done. All of those things uh, have to be distinct uh, for us to function as a body. Uh, so verses 21 to 26. Uh, this is uh, talking about the other side of the argument where someone feels more important than another person. Uh, so they think, OK, uh, because I'm the eye, I don't need the hand. Because I'm the head, I don't need the feet. Uh, right? So the previous section was where the person who is uh, the person themselves feels unimportant, and so they feel they don't have a role to play in the body. This is the opposite side where they, uh, where someone feels so important that they don't see a need for other people in the body. Uh, they don't recognize that other people have a part to play in their own, uh, in their own spiritual growth, and they don't recognize the contribution of other people to their, uh, to the functioning of the church. Um, so here, verse 22 is uh, lifting up those people who are in a place where this uh, or place of unimportance. So he says, uh, those parts that seem indispensable, uh, those parts that seem to be weak are actually the most important parts, the parts that we cannot do without. Uh, and that's so true. Um, if we just take, for example, uh, some of the roles in our churches today, like uh, the people who uh, come and do the setup, uh, setting up things within the church, uh, say just putting out chairs or uh, setting up uh, mics or doing different things like that. They are never seen. Nobody in the church actually sees them coming in, uh, say at six o'clock in the morning or a few hours before the service starts to do that work that they do. Uh, 
And so sometimes we can completely forget that those people are there and those people are needed. Uh, but we never see them on stage. We never see them on the camera. And uh, so you just don't, you don't know the work that is going on behind so many things that have happened on a Sunday service or at a gathering. Uh, and so this point of the people that seem to be weaker are indispensable is so true because if those people were not there, we would not have anything else. We would not be able to have any of the singing. We would not be able to have uh, any place to sit down if the chairs weren't laid out for people to be sitting down. Um, so sometimes those very important roles are forgotten because they are not right up in front of us. They are not the ones that we see on stage. Uh, verse 23, the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat. Uh, so just like in our own physical bodies, uh, the parts that are less honorable are treated with special honor, right? So we have a special modesty uh, that is given to the parts uh, uh, to the parts that are considered less honorable. In the same way, uh, we uh, should recognize these people within the church that have roles that we think are not as glamorous uh, or not as important as the role of the preacher or the role of the singer or somebody else uh, who is considered important in the church. Um, so verse 25, there should be no division in the body. We should have equal concern for each other. If one suffers, everyone suffers. If one is honored, uh, everyone rejoices with it. Uh, and now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. So whether you are a, you consider yourself lesser, whether you consider yourself greater, uh, doesn't matter. Everyone who is within the church has a part to play. Uh, and we should have equal concern for one another. Uh, so if one is suffering, everyone suffers. If one is honored, everyone rejoices. That should be the uh, attitude with which we relate with one another within the church. Uh, so we we'll quickly just look at our notes as well. Uh, so this gives us a summary of uh, what uh, we looked at in these verses 12 to 27. Uh, the body has many members, so uh, there are people with different roles, different functions within the body. We are not all the same. Uh, the second is everyone who is within the church is a member of the body. Uh, there's no one who is not needed. Uh, third is we are not independent. We need one another. Okay, so just because we have a more important role doesn't mean that we don't need somebody else. Uh, and when I say more important role, it doesn't mean that it's more important in God's eyes. It's actually mostly within, uh, as humans, we view certain roles as more important, or we um, kind of put certain roles on a pedestal. Uh, so from that perspective, if you are in a role where you are put on a pedestal, it doesn't mean that uh, people who are not there with you are people who are not needed. Um, then the fourth is there are diverse functions in the body. So we need to be able to celebrate each of these roles, each of the functions that are being played by different people within the church. Uh, the fifth is God places us in these roles and functions, and he places us based on what he thinks is best for us and what pleases him. Uh, so we should look at this as a gift that God has given us, right? It's a privilege to be part of the body, and it's a privilege to have any role to play within the body. Um, and so, like the psalm says, "Let me be a doorkeeper in the house of the God, uh, house of the Lord." So it's not about do I have an important role? Do I have a role that is being recognized? It is the fact that I even have a role is a gift from God. Um, Six, um, it takes every person within the church to make up the world. We can't do without uh, anyone. We uh, can't give up uh, on a certain role. Every person is needed to fulfill their role for us to fulfill uh, all of the functions that the body needs to be doing. Um, 
and then yeah we can never claim independence we already said uh god gives greater honor to what seems to have less honor uh that's an important point so uh so let us not be too quick to seek positions that have honor in people's eyes uh because god in fact uh gives honor to those who are less honored so uh we can be satisfied in the fact that god sees our work and he will give us the honor that is due to us um and then the last point is uh god doesn't want any division within the body but that we uh demonstrate mutual love and care so that that part about suffering and rejoicing with one another so to be so concerned for one another that when someone hurts you hurt when someone uh is experiencing something good instead of being jealous or uh envious or uh, coveting what they have you're able to celebrate and rejoice with them um okay so i think we've already covered all of this so we'll go on from here to verse 28 onwards uh someone can just read verse 28 till the end of the chapter First Corinthians chapter twelve verse twenty eight, and God has appointed these in the church: first apostles, second prophets, third teachers; after that miracles, then gift of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. So uh, here we see Paul now referring to the uh, ministry functions. So before this, uh, he had covered the spiritual gifts that were available to the whole church. uh but now he uh, goes into some roles some functions some gifts that are limited to certain people uh so he says god has appointed these in the church uh, now has appointed is uh to mean that god has put these people in place uh for his purpose so god is the head he is the decision maker he is the authority and he decides who goes where uh, what they should be doing uh, what gifts they should have what roles or functions they should have so god himself has appointed people uh, to these uh, functions uh, and says has appointed these in the church now uh, some translations uh, take this as god has appointed some in the church uh, kjv and um, i think there's uh, a few other translations that take that as some which means that uh, the, these gifts are for some people for specific people not for everyone within the church uh, so this is how these uh, functions are different from the gifts of the spirit because this is for a few people whereas the gifts of the spirit are for everyone uh, so he says first apostles so when you talk about first uh, it means uh, first uh can mean first in terms of uh in position like in a place of authority um or a place of influence or a place of uh honor within the church so the apostles have been uh, put first in that way but also have been put first in time so uh, they were the first ones to uh encounter jesus to uh, be filled with the holy spirit and they were the first ones to be sent out to uh, reach others with the gospel and so the apostles are not only first in terms of their role in leadership but also in terms of uh, being uh, people who have encountered uh, god and then go out and 
uh, reach out to others because of their encounter with God. Um, so second, prophets, third, teachers. After that, miracles, healings, helps, administration. Uh, so helps talks about people who um, in any way are more perform a role of service. So uh, people who are there to uh, to come alongside to uh, help carry out the work that is being done, provide some kind of assistance uh, to the work that is being done. Uh, and administration uh, is uh, people who have a place uh, of it's it kind of means to rule or to govern, uh, like one who is directing a ship, so who directs where a ship should turn, uh, which way it should go. Uh, so an administrator is someone who kind of steers, who uh, moves the church, moves uh, a particular ministry in a certain direction. Uh, so we see here Paul is listing out ministry gifts as well as membership gifts. We talked about this earlier, right? The uh, difference between the ministry gifts, uh, which is the apostle, the prophet, the pastor, the teacher, uh, the uh, evangelist. Um, so uh, those are the ministry gifts that are given to specific people within the church to equip the body of Christ. Uh, and so he talks about, the, he says, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers. And then he says, miracles and gifts of healing, uh, which are typically the gifts that evangelists are given. Uh, that uh, as they preach the gospel, uh, it is accompanied by miracles and healings. And so, uh, that can be taken where he's listed miracles and gifts of healing um, as part of the ministry gifts that he's talking about. So as part of the uh, gifts given to evangelists. Uh, on the other hand, he talks about membership gifts. So he talks about uh, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Uh, so membership gifts are the gifts that are given to uh, people within the church to carry out their function or their role within the church. Okay, so um, let's see. So because he starts off his section saying some, this is given to some, uh, we conclude that these gifts are not available for all believers, uh, meaning not everyone is an apostle or prophet, a teacher, an evangelist, or a pastor, right? Uh, those are given to specific people. Uh, likewise, not everyone is given uh, the gift of administration, so the membership gifts. Uh, not everyone has the gift of administration. Uh, that is given to specific people to carry out their role or their function. Um, or not everyone has the gift of, so when he talks about varieties of tongues, uh, someone who plays the role of an intercessor, someone who uh, brings messages in tongues to people. So they uh, bring a message in tongues and they're able to interpret it. Uh, so these are given to specific people, meaning uh, this is a role that is given. So in a gathering, someone may have uh, that gift of tongues to speak something to the congregation at a gathering, uh, where that gift of tongues is given to everyone within the church. But this is where someone's given a role as an intercessor or a role as uh, someone who uh, is specifically uh, giving messages to people in tongues and interpreting those things. That is their specific function within the body. Uh, so that is the difference between uh, the person who is gifted as an intercessor versus someone who is exercising the spiritual gift of speaking in tongues. Um, so then he goes on in verse 30, uh, asking um, a few rhetorical questions, right? So he says, uh, verse 29 and 30, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have? He's listing the same things that he talked about before this. He's repeating all of them and he's saying, 
does everyone exercises and we uh he's asking rhetorically meaning no not everyone's an apostle not everyone is a prophet not everyone is a teacher uh, so from this passage itself we can see that he is saying that this is something that is given only to a few people uh, but we differentiate this from what he's talked about earlier in the chapter uh, when he's talking about the gifts of the spirit so that we understand is available uh, to everyone uh, but these specific uh, gifts and functions are given to specific people not everyone can carry out those functions not everyone uh, is given those positions of a apostle teacher, a prophet teacher. Okay, um, I think we have one more minute. So we'll just finish the, this chapter and then we'll take a break. Um, and then verse 31 says, but earnestly desire the best gifts and I will show you a more excellent way. Uh, so uh, we, we see that we can desire the gifts, right? Uh, we go back to uh, that initial uh, section where he talked about, I don't want you to be ignorant about the gifts. Uh, so those spiritual gifts, we can desire those gifts. Uh, and when he's talking about the best gifts, it means uh, the gifts that would be most suited as we gather as a church. What is the gift that is needed in this gathering that will benefit the rest of the church? Uh, because that's what he's talked about in this chapter. The gifts are given for the benefit of everyone in the church. And uh, with this chapter and the previous chapter, he's talking within the context of uh, when we gather as a church. Right? He talked about the Lord's Supper. He talked about covering your heads. Uh, so even this exercise of spiritual gifts, he's talking about it within the context of our gathering as a church. Desire the best gifts that are needed in that time when you gather um, so that you are able to minister to people's needs. People are coming into the church with certain needs uh, and they need to be ministered to. If you desire for the gift that will benefit people, uh, then what you say or what you do will actually minister to the need that they have come with. And so that's why you should come with that desire. Uh, and then we'll go on into the next chapter. Okay, we can stop here and we'll come back in 10 minutes and start the chapter 13.